All right, we're about to begin our second portion of God's Word. We can just file in and have a seat. A couple of things right before we jump in. Um, and Jason and uh, Aaron has left some cards and also some information on the Texas School of Preaching. And this is a, one of the new preaching schools that is now starting this fall. And so how many students, Jason? Five full-time enrolled Five full-time enrolled. That's, that's amazing. That's awesome. If you want to know more information, this is an amazing work to support. Uh, for those who went up to Kansas Expressway and heard uh, Terrence Brown Lodendi, uh, he's also there. He's actually the administrator or the director over there, and uh, Jason is the associate director. And so if you want more information on that back divider, is a whole packet. And there's also a business card from Jason. And if you want to know more about Aaron and the podcast, The Authentic Christian, or even Answering the Error, there's also these little cards back there. Make sure you grab it. If you're a podcast kind of person, definitely look up this podcast. You'll enjoy that as well. Go ahead. Are you sure? No, he doesn't agree. He's, are you in the book? I looked over you. Oh, they stuck you in the back, brother. I'm sorry. They didn't even put, I'll have to say this, they did put you on the front cover, so that's good. In fact, I think that's Kennewick, ain't it? Yeah. So we got to take pictures of all y'all before you leave. It's hard to find pictures of you guys. So I don't want to take Aaron's time. Aaron is going to come up here. He's going to preach on uh, the Bible must be rightly divided. I don't know if you've caught the theme yet, but we're breaking this all down. And so reinforcing about the, the one tool, the one sword that we have that we use all the time is God's word. And for that, we are definitely getting our dosage of, of equipping ourselves, and so I'm so thankful for that. And so, without further ado, Aaron, come preach. Good evening. Thanks for being back out on a Monday. Um, you know, there's lots of other places, as Mornay said, that you could be. And so, uh, I'm thankful. You know, we're going to be here. So, I'm thankful that, that you all are here, too, and that you're getting to learn more about, about the Bible. You know, if you think about it, what, we have three hours, four hours yesterday, five hours, two tonight? I mean, before you had, I'm not a math whiz, but, you know, you get nine or ten hours, I mean, in one week. That's really gonna, how you're going to learn the Bible. So we're going to talk a little bit tonight about how the Bible can be uh, rightly divided. You know, we've looked uh, already over the last few days that the Bible's been revealed to us. Romans 1.20 and following talks about how when you go outside and you look at those trees, when you look at the sunset, when you look at all those things, it just came from nowhere, right? You know, you have some of these guys, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens. I forget. I always get them mixed up. But one of those guys was on a, a, a talk show in England. And, uh, you know, it's one of these late-night talk shows, and millions of people are watching. And they were asking him about the origins of the universe, and he explained it in this real fancy talk. And I remember the crowd uh, the, responded. The, the host said, so you're saying everything exploded. Nothing exploded and created everything. And he said, yes, that's, that's pretty much what I'm saying. And the audience laughed at him. I mean, I thought it was pretty comical, too. But that when you boil it all down, that's what it is. Nothing exploded and created everything, right? You know that that's nonsense. When you look out and you see the trees and the animals, you know that there's a creator. But you don't know much about him other than he's got awesome power. And so he reveals himself to us in, in, in his will through the scriptures. We talked about how the Bible is complete. It's infallible. We talked about how it's authoritative and how it can be understood. You know, Mornay did a great job in the last hour talking about the Bible can be understood. Think about this. We know that God is good, right, and all-powerful and knowledgeable. What kind of God, a God of love, would give you a book, say he's going to judge you on it, and then say that well, you can't understand it? John 12, 48 says on the last day we're going to be judged by what? The words that Christ spoke. What kind of God says, uh, this is what you're going to be judged on, but you can't really understand it? Would you think that's fair if you had a high school or a college teacher that gave you that sort of assignment? I'm going to test you on this, pass, fail, but you can't understand it. I'm not going to teach it to you. Of course we know that that's nonsense. And so if we know that we can understand the Bible, it's perfect and it's infallible, tonight we're going to talk about how, how can we rightly divide it. Open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 15. The scripture reads this. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I want to start off with a story. You, I told you that yesterday I like history. Uh, there's somebody that, when I say the names Nikola Tesla, 
uh, you know who that is. When I say Thomas Edison, you know who that is. Uh, when I say Albert Einstein, you know who that is. Henry Ford, right? When I say this guy's name, his name is Charles Proteus Steinmetz. Anybody know that name? Uh, in this story, I think he's maybe one of the most fascinating. Charles Proteus Steinmetz. Uh, he was born in Germany in 1865, and in 1888, he fled to Ellis Island. He wanted to come from Germany, he went to Switzerland, and he wanted to come to the United States. Uh, he was a mathematician, and uh, he was four feet tall. Who's four feet tall? How tall are you? Four feet tall? All right. This guy, Charles Proteus Steinmetz, was four feet tall. He had a congenital defect, and he had a hunchback, right? So he's four feet tall. He gets to Ellis Island. Uh, he has this thick German accent. He doesn't speak English. He has a cold. His face is swollen. And they almost don't let him into the United States. Except his friend who's with him says, look, this guy's a genius. You, you need to let this guy in. He's a genius. And so they, uh, the guy that was with traveling with him had some money. And I don't know if they bribed him or, or what. But Charles Proteus Steinmetz, he got into the United States. It didn't take long before his genius was seen. You know, the middle name that he took, he wasn't actually born with it. But when he was in Germany, some of his, uh, his college uh, math club and geometry club guys gave him the nickname Proteus because in Greek mythology, there was this sea god that Homer wrote about. He called him the old man from the sea. He was prophetic. He could see the future, had all these powers. But that's when he was in his sea god form. When he took the form of a man, he took the form of a hunchback. And so Charles took this middle name Proteus because he thought his buddies called it, it was like a nickname. And he thought, well, I'm already hunchbacked, and these guys are basically comparing me to this god of mythology because how smart I am. So he liked it, and he made it his middle name. So he gets to the United States, and his genius is seen pretty quickly. Pretty soon, Thomas Edison and General Electric, GE, I'm sure you've heard of them, they hired him, they bought all of his patents, and basically paid him, I think, $3,000 a year to basically say, they do whatever you want to do, but anything that you create, if you find something cool, let us know, and then we get the patent rights to it. So $3,000 then, I think, is like maybe $100,000 now. So they give him this great salary, and he starts making huge advances in uh, um, electricity, uh, direct current, alternating current, right? And he's a name that you've probably never heard of, but one of my favorite stories about him is that at one point in time, you, you, Henry Ford, you've heard of Henry Ford, right? I drive a Ford, and you drive a Ford, right? Some people drive Fords, okay? Henry Ford had a factory in Dearborn, Michigan, and they had this gigantic generator that was very important, really expensive. And they had a problem with this generator, and even Westinghouse, who was another guy in the electric game, even his engineers who made it couldn't fix it. And so they tried to find somebody to fix it, and they called this guy, this guy they called Steinmetz. And so Steinmetz goes to Dearborn, Michigan. He walks in. He gets there, and all the engineers are trying to tell him, you know, what's wrong with it. And he said, look, I don't need anybody's help. I want you to leave me alone. I want you to give me a pencil, a notepad, and a cot for him to sleep on. And he said, I want you to leave me alone. And so for two days, Steinmetz sat in that factory. He slept. He ate. He drank. He just sat and looked and listened for two days, two entire days, to this generator, right? Sat right next to it. Everybody leave me alone. He's taking little notes, writing down probably equations. And at the end of the second day, he asked for a ladder. He's four feet tall. So he climbs up this ladder. He takes a piece of white chalk, and he marks this big X on the generator. And he tells the technicians, I, I want you to climb up there, remove the plate, and you're going to replace 16 field core windings. Now, I don't know what a field core winding is, all right? But he did. And he says, you're going to replace 16 of those. And all of the, uh, the, the Henry Ford factory generator guys are like, okay, they're skeptical. But guess what they do? They take the plate off, they replace these 16 core field windings, and whatever they're called, and um, the generator starts working perfectly. And so Henry Ford, this thing's expensive. So Henry Ford is what? He's excited, right? He's excited, and he's, he's thinking, man, this Steinmetz guy's a genius, until he gets a bill in the mail, and the bill is for $10,000. And so he, he's, he's obviously excited about his machine working, but the question he has is, well, now why did it cost me $10,000? All this guy did was sit there for two days and take notes and listen to it. And so he wrote and said, I'm very excited, but I, I want an itemized bill, right? You ever done that? You ask somebody for a bill and they give you a price and you're like, well, I want to know what you spent, right? So he asked for an itemized bill and Steinmetz actually replied to this one personally. And he said, uh, this is the, the line, I heard two line items. The first one said, making a, uh, a chalk X on the generator, $1. He said, knowing exactly where to put that X, $9,999. <laughs> Henry Ford paid the bill promptly, 
And that's the end of the story. I, I don't know anything else other than he just paid the bill, right? Now, why do I tell that story, right? I like history, and, and preachers love stories, uh, but there's a point to that. Um, what is the point of that story? How did Steinmetz know how to fix the problem? He spent two days doing what? He was focused on what? One thing, one problem, right? He, it wasn't just those two days. What had he also spent all the time before? His entire life had been dedicated to mathematics, mechanics, engineering, right? That, that was his wheelhouse, as we would say. He was dedicated. He spent time. He was focused. He read. He studied about it. And thus, whenever the opportunity presented itself, what was he ready for? He was ready to solve the problem. The reason that I like that story is because if you're here tonight and you want to know about the Bible, how to rightfully divide it, how to rightly handle, handle a right, depending on your translation, you have to spend time doing what? Studying it. When you look at that verse, the result is that you can handle it aright. The result is that you know how to accurately handle it. That's the result. What's the cause? The cause is that you're diligent, you're zealous, you spend time and you study it. And that's what the scripture says. If we want to know how to rightly divide the Bible, we have to spend time, effort, and focus studying it. Be diligent, study, take pains, make every effort. Rightly divide, correctly handle. The Greek word is orthotomeo. Now in Greek, I'm not a Greek expert, right? Sometimes I think us preachers, and we probably do just say Greek words and make us sound real smart, right? But in Greek, when you have two words, sometimes they put them together. One of the, the words that I think is really cool is uh, hupakuo. Hupo is the word for under, like hypodermic needle. And akuo, I think of an acoustic guitar, is hearing. That's one of the words for obedience. So the word for obedience is you put yourself under what you hear. So I hear something and I say I'm going to submit to that, and that's the word for obedience, right? This word is made up of two words. One of those words, as far as correctly handle, it's, it's talking about the word straight, and it's the word ortho, right? Like when I was a kid, okay, I had snaggle teeth, all right? I drank a lot of apple juice as a kid, and I didn't brush my teeth, and I had really bad teeth. And so even when my permanent teeth came in, I had to go to a what? Orthodontist. And he made my teeth so nice and pretty, and he gave me this retainer and said, wear your retainer all the time. And then he sa I said, I have to wear it all the time? He's like, well, you really need to wear it at night, but if I tell you to wear it all the time, you're more likely to wear it. You know how much I wore it? And what happened to my teeth? not that straight anymore, okay? I'm not getting braces again. But ortho means to make straight, okay? When you go to an orthopedic surgeon, when you break your arm, what's he supposed to do? What's the point of his job? To make it straight, right? This is the only time in the New Testament this, this word appears. But if you actually go back and look in your Old Testament, in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6, right? Proverbs is originally written in Hebrew. But about 200 years before Jesus, there were some people in Greek that wanted to read the Old Testament, that didn't know Hebrew, and so they did what? They translated it from Hebrew into Greek, and they call it the Septuagint, okay? And in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6, it uses this word. Let's look at this. I'm going to start in verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Verse 6. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. He'll make your paths what? Straight. I think that this passage in Proverbs 3, 6 and 2 Timothy 2, 15 are pretty much saying the same thing. They're saying, if you don't want to be ashamed, if you want to know God's word, you have to do what? Study it. You don't lean on your own understanding. There's a way that seems right unto the man, and the ends are the way of what? Death. In the book of Judges, what was the problem? Every man did what was right in his own eyes. It's this idea of postmodernism, right? This idea that, well, everybody has their own truth. No, they don't. There's one truth, John 17, 17, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. And either you agree with God's truth and you're right, or you don't and you're what? You're wrong. Jesus told people they were wrong. In Matthew chapter 22, I'll, I'll get to that passage in a little, little bit. He said, you err, you're wrong, because you don't know the what? The scriptures. It's possible for us to be wrong if we don't know the scriptures or if we're not handling the scriptures right. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you want to go to heaven, if you want to rightly divide the word, we have to spend time studying. If you can rightly divide it, what's that imply? You can also what? Wrongly divide it, right? In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 3, Jesus, uh, his, him and his disciples were accused 
of uh, basically breaking the Sabbath because they were plucking off heads of grain, right? And Jesus says, have you not read? If you go through that, uh, that story, what actually you find out is that what they were doing was completely legal. It was in the law of Moses in Deuteronomy, I believe. They were allowed to do that. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4, Jesus is asked a question about marriage, divorce, remarriage, and he says, have you not read? In Matthew twenty two twenty nine, you are mistaken not knowing the scriptures. Go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Go to verse 1. Mornay talked about this passage a little bit, the overall context. Look, look at chapter 10 and verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. He's talking about physical Israel, his brethren according to the flesh. Romans 9, 1 through 3 talks about that. I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to what? Knowledge. I see that a lot today. I, I meet a lot of people, believe it or not, who uh, are members of different churches, uh, denominational churches, that they got a zeal for God. When I talk about these Mormons that are out there door knocking, you think that takes zeal? You better believe it does. They go door knocking some places in Memphis that we have a hard time getting members of the church to go. They have a zeal for God, but it's not according to what? Knowledge. And thus, what did he just say in verse 1? I wish they were saved. Is zeal without knowledge enough to save somebody? It's not. I bear them witness they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Verse 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So basically they were zealous, but they were making up their own righteousness instead of following whose righteousness? God's righteousness. If we want to be saved, we have to, to study in order to rightly divide and follow God's righteousness. Go to 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13, your Old Testament. We live in a world today that a lot of, uh, I'd say, religious people claim to speak for God. And a lot of them don't speak for God. They claim to, but they're teaching something that's in error. Go to 1, uh, 1 Kings chapter 13. This is a story. You have a man, uh, a young prophet, who is he's sent from Judah to Bethel to warn Jeroboam. In 1 Kings chapter 12, Jeroboam has... Uh, entered this idolatrous worship because he says, hey, if I don't get these people worshiping up here, they're going to go back to Jerusalem and I'm going to lose these ten tribes that have been following me. Look at uh, 1 Kings 13, 1. Behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. Okay, so he goes up and he speaks to Jeroboam. Hop over to verse 5. The altar was split and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had been given by the word of the Lord. God says, go up and perform this sign to Jeroboam. And he goes up and the sign happens Go down to verse 6. The man entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored and became as before. Verse 7. Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. Now, the man of God was told to go up and to deliver this message, and to do what? Get on home. He was told to go up and go home. Don't stop. Don't go eat with anybody. And yet Jeroboam, the king, says, If you come home with me and refresh yourself, take a break. I'll give you a reward. Look at verse 8. But the man of God said to the king, if you were going to give me half of your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread, nor drink water in your place. Now look at verse 9. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, this is what God told him, okay? You shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way that you came. God says, I want you to go up, deliver this message, and I want you to come back. I want you to go a different way, right? God tells him what to do. Verse 10. So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. So the king asks him, and he says no to the king. He, he, he's got a good start. Okay? He's obeying God's word so far. Verse 11. Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. And their father said, Which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went who came from Judah. So he said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me. And they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode it. And he went after the man of God. So you have this old prophet who's in Bethel. This seems to be a prophet of God. The Bible addresses him as a prophet, right? Now maybe he's wondering, why didn't God send me? Well, I don't know what a prophet's doing in Bethel anyway with all the false worship, but maybe, who knows? God has his own reasons. He sends the young prophet, and the old prophet says, well, I want to talk to this guy. And the old prophet knows. He's already told the king, hey, I can't stay with you. God told me not to. Look at verse 15. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. So now the old prophet is telling the young prophet, I want you to come back with me. And this is what the young prophet says, verse 16. I cannot return with you, nor go in with you, 
Neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place, for I have been told by the word of the who? The word of the Lord, Yahweh. It's in all capitalized letters. You shall not eat bread nor drink water, nor return by going the way you came. So the young man says, look, I understand you're a prophet. I'm going to tell you the same thing I told the king. I'm not coming back with you. Look at the next verse, verse 18. He said to him, this is the old prophet, I too am a prophet as you are, and an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord. Look, I, I know God told you not to come back to my house, but guess what? An angel spoke to me, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was what? He was lying to him. He was lying to him. So this, this young prophet is faced with a decision. He says, you know what? God told me what? God told me directly, go up, deliver your message, and come back another way. Now this old prophet says, hey, no, 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 God talked to me too. I, I have a message from God. God said you're supposed to come with me, but he did what? He lied to him. Now when we think of this, if you don't know this story, what, what do you think God would do? If you look at the next verse, verse 19, so he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Now you might think, well, look, I know that God told this guy directly, but you know, God's probably going to say, now look, I didn't tell you to do that, but I'm going to let it slide because this guy lied to you, and he said he was a man of God, and so I understand you were deceived. Look at what God says. Now it happened, he sat at the table, and the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. So now God actually speaks to the old prophet, the one who lied to him. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah. This is the young prophet. And the old prophet says to him, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you. But you came back and ate bread and drank water in the place which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread, drink no water. Your corpse will not come to the tomb of your fathers. So it was after he had eaten bread and, and had drunk, he saddled the donkey for him and the prophet whom he had brought back. When he was gone, this is the young prophet, a lion met him on the road and what? Killed him. And his corpse was thrown on the road, and the donkey stood by it, and the lion stood by the corpse. You ever seen any videos on National Geographic of what lions do? Does that sound like a natural occurrence to you? A lion and a donkey just standing there, kind of? What do you think a lion would normally do? He would attack it, right? This lion comes out of a thicket, kills this young prophet as punishment, and then it stands by the corpse. And there men passed by, verse 25, and saw the corpse and the lion standing by the corpse, and they went and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. Now when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it, he said, it is the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. So this young prophet in this story, he's given a direct message from God. Another man of God tells him something even though he lied to him. And what is God, does, God, does God let it slide? What did God expect for the young prophet to do? God expected the young prophet to honor the word that he told him, right? What's the application of that story? There's a lot of religious people today. They're inside the church too. In Acts chapter 20, verses 28 and 29, he's telling the, the elders of, of Ephesus, and he says what? Beware, they're also going to rise up from among where? Among yourselves, right? There are lots of false teachers. Matthew 7, 15 says, beware of false teachers, because outside they look like what? Sheep, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. They look like sheep. That means you take a look at them and you can't tell until they start doing what? Talking. Whenever they start talking is when you can tell that they're a false teacher. If we're going to accurately divide and rightly divide the word of truth, we have to pay attention to what people say. Now we're going to go through this and, and give a couple principles. Some of these to you may be basic, but that's okay. Because guess what? The Bible's written on what, a fifth to eighth grade level? Some of this stuff doesn't have to be complicated. We just have to remember it and we have to, we have to act on it and live on it. I want to start off with some foundational principles for rightly dividing. I want to talk about the divisions. Let's start with the Old Testament, all right? You don't have to raise your hand, but in the Old Testament, what are the numbers they taught you to remember? Five, twelve, five, five, what? Twelve. Five, twelve, five, five, twelve. Those are the divisions of the Old Testament. The first division is the division of what? Law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay? Now, I have a handout that I'm not going to give out to you before, because I know what you probably be... No, you wouldn't do that. You would wait and have it sit here until after the lesson to look at it, right? No. I have a, a little handout that I made for our youth group that I'm going to get to Dustin, and anyone that wants it, you can, you can feel free to get it through email, or I'm sure he can print some copies off. But I did this for a youth group once, where we went through, and, and I just made... Uh, this is the Old Testament. 
one line, little summary for each book of the Bible, okay? The real, I think, intention of this was to get the chronological ideas down. Because I remember growing up, when I studied the book of the Bible, I'd read through, I'd read all the way through uh, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and it's in chronological order, right? All the way through the first five, and all the history books. And then I would get to Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, and I'd be like, wait a minute, per who's per why is Persia in rule? And then I would keep reading, and I'd go through, and I would get all the way down to Ezekiel and Daniel. And now, now I'm really confused, because now they're in Babylonian captivity, right? We need to remember that the Bible and the Old Testament, that all the books are not in chronological order, okay? So on this sheet, what I have is I have the first five, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then I have Joshua, Judges, Ruth, where they have left Egypt now. They've finished their wandering. Joshua has led them across the, Jericho, uh, across the river into Jericho, where they've, they've taken the land of Canaan. They've divided it. And then you have Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, where you have David made king. You have Saul, David, Solomon. Then you have First and Second Kings, Elijah, Elisha, First and Second Chronicles. And then I have a gap here that says what? Babylonian captivity, okay? After the time of Second Kings and Second Chronicles, they go into captivity where? In Babylon. Then you have Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, which chronologically take place after the captivity, all right? As far as chronological order from there, what does it do? It goes all over the place. When you go to the next five books, after the five of law and the twelve of history, what are the next five? The wisdom literature. You have first the book of Job. Now, historically, or chronologically, the book of Job was under the, the uh, age of patriarchy, which we'll get to in, in a minute. Job offered sacrifices for his family, did he not? Is that how it worked under the law of Moses? No, the priests offered the sacrifices, correct? You, as a, as, as a father, a leader, would take your animal to the priests, okay? You'd slit its throat, it would be offered. But in the book of Job, that's not what you see. Job was likely the time of Abraham, if you look at the different characteristics. I believe Job 22, 16 talks about it was after the flood. Yet the age of Job shows that he was living not too far after the flood, likely around the time of Abraham, or maybe Abraham's relatives, okay? Then after Job, you have Psalms and Proverbs. We know that most of the Psalms were written by who? Written by David, which would be the time of what? 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, okay? Then after that, you have, after Psalms, you have Proverbs, which was written by Solomon, which would be the time of 1 Kings, okay? And then after that, after you have J.P. Pez, is how I remember it, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, also written by Solomon. And then you have the Song of Solomon, all right, or Song of Songs. Uh, I believe it says that Solomon wrote over a thousand songs in, in first, uh, first Kings, I believe it is. And so you have those five books of, of wisdom literature. And then you get into the next 17 of the Old Testament, which are the prophets. And you have the five major prophets, which are more important than the minor prophets, right? No, no. They're just bigger books, okay? The major prophets are bigger books. You have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Now, on this sheet, if you wanted, I have Isaiah. For instance, Isaiah. During the days of Uzziah, 2 Kings 15, the prophet Isaiah, although that book comes way after, uh, after Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, chronologically, it's back during the time of 2 Kings 15. Jeremiah is next. It's the, the time of 2 Kings chapter 21. Lamentations is five funeral songs, basically, that Jeremiah who's in 2 Kings 21, writes after the destruction of Jerusalem. This is the city he loves, and he's sitting there looking at it, and he's lamenting over the destruction that Babylon has done. And then you have Ezekiel and Daniel. Ezekiel and Daniel are during the time of the Babylonian captivity. And then you have the 12 minor prophets. Uh, when you go back and look at how the Jews group them, they just group them together as one that they call the 12, okay? But you have the 12 minor prophets. Nine of those take place before the Babylonian exile, and three take place afterwards. Why is that important? Because a lot of times, do you know what happens whenever you start talking with somebody that's going to maybe try to teach you or draw you away or toss you to and fro on false doctrines? A lot of times they go to obscure books that maybe you haven't studied, and they say, well, have you read this passage here? And this passage is referring to this, and unless you know what the book is about, you can be misled. I have one for the New Testament as well, although the New Testament, I think, is, is much easier. We know that there's four Gospels in the New Testament, right? The Gospels are written to tell you about the life of who? Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's one book of history, Acts, and that book basically sets the background for the rest of the New Testament, does it not? You know, I always think it's interesting whenever you talk with people about baptism. Did you know that not one time from Romans through Revelation did any writer say, well, now that you're saved, you're supposed to do what? Be baptized. It was always assumed, hey, if you're a member of the church, if I'm writing a letter to you, you've already 
called on the name of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, to all the saints that have called on the name of the Lord, right? And then you have basically Romans through Revelation that are all letters written to who? Christians. They're all letters written to Christians to tell us how to live. The issues that the church was dealing with. The book of Revelation, victory, even in persecution. When you look through those books of the Bible, it's important to know what each of those books of the Bible teaches so that we can become familiar with it. We also should think about dispensations. Now, when I say dispensation, sometimes people say covenants, and I'm okay with that because uh, a covenant is an agreement, right, between two parties. And these would be, I guess you'd say, I don't want to say worldwide covenants because when you get to the law of Moses, it was between God and a nation. But dispensations, uh, the word dispensation is, uh, an easy way to remember it, is ways that God dispensed his word. The first one that we see is the one that the patriarchs, or uh, the Greek word for father is pater, P-E-T-E-R, right? And P-A-T-E-R, and that's how uh, we get the word patriarch. And so this would have been the law that, that Adam, that Abraham, that Noah, that uh, Isaac and Jacob all followed. And that was basically where the father uh, offered the sacrifices for the family. And we see in the Old Testament that that leads all the way up until when they come out of Egypt and they go to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, God separates a people for himself, not because they were special, Deuteronomy 9, but because God was going to show his power through them and he was going to bring the Messiah. And that was the nation of Israel, the descendants of Jacob and his 12 sons. And so they're, they're given the law of Moses. Uh, open up your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. You know, I, I don't know if I see this more and more because it's becoming more prevalent or if I just happen to run into certain circles lately, but uh, there's a lot, there are movements that I've seen to try to bring back this idea of, well, we should be worshiping on the Sabbath. People say, well, the Sabbath is actually, it's an eternal law. They'll say that that wasn't just given to uh, the people of Israel. It was given to, to all, it was given all the way back into, into Genesis chapter 1. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 5. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 1. And Moses called all of Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord God made a covenant with who? With us in Horeb, right? That's Mount Sinai. The Lord did not make this covenant with who? Our fathers, the patriarchs, the people that came before us. God did not make a covenant with them, this covenant, the law of Moses. But with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. The Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire, and I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up to the mountain. He's talking about Exodus chapter 20. In fact, he's going to restate the Ten Commandments. If you look in verse 7, you shall have no other gods before me. So he says this covenant, God didn't make this covenant with the people before us. He didn't make it with our fathers. He made it with us, the people that came out of Israel. Look in chapter 4 and verse 13. Deuteronomy 5, 2 said the Lord made a covenant with us. What covenant is that? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13. So he declared to you his what? His covenant, which he commanded you to perform the ten what? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were given to the nation of Israel. Now, I know this is, uh, this is very confusing to some people today because they say, aren't, aren't we still under the Ten Commandments? We know that in Romans chapter 7, what the point that Paul's making is if you want to be married to Christ, you've got to be dead to the law. And then people say, well, what, what law is he talking about? And in Romans chapter 7 and verse 7, he says, the law, which says what? Thou shalt not covet. You can use Google, fancy Bible software. I don't say that condescendingly. I like fancy Bible software. But you can go look, and you'll find that thou shalt not covet is in the Ten Commandments. You're not going to find it in many places. All it's, it's in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 5 there, and it's also in Exodus chapter 20, those two places that the Ten Commandments are given. So Paul says if you want to be married to Christ, you can't be married to the law of Moses as well, the Ten Commandments, or else you're committing spiritual what? Adultery. The law of Moses was given to the nation of Israel. It was not given to us. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. The law of Moses continued... Uh, up until basically the day of Pentecost. Now, we know the Bible says that it was nailed to the cross, but we're going to look at that and see, you know, the, the, the will and testament, whenever somebody dies, Hebrews 9, 16, and 17 says that a will doesn't go into effect till after men are dead, right? If you've ever had to deal with a will and somebody dying, you know that the day that they die, you don't get all the stuff the next day, okay? I don't know from experience. I've never had anybody leave me a bunch of stuff in a will. But you have to go through a period of probate, right? And then whenever probate is over, that's whenever the assets are distributed, right? I told you to go to, what did I tell you, Ephesians 2? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. So what happened to the law of Moses? 
We know that it was taken out of the way. Look at verse 14, Ephesians 2. For he himself, Christ, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Now, in the Jewish temple, there was a four-foot wall uh, that was basically separating the court of the Gentiles uh, and the Jews. And so the, the illusion he's making here is he's saying, hey, that separation that used to be in the law of Moses between Jew and Gentile, it's gone. And actually, you can go look. They found archaeologically, like in the 1870s maybe, uh, this little impression from this wall, and it had engravings on it. Josephus wrote about it, and then, surprise, surprise, archaeology confirmed what the Bible says about this middle wall of separation, where it basically says, hey, if, this is what the Jews said in this inscription. Hey, if you're a Gentile, I just want you to know, if you cross, I'm paraphrasing, if you cross over this four-foot wall, you're responsible for your own death. That's what the middle wall of partition was. And so it says here that Christ has torn down that middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, what did Christ abolish in his flesh? How did he make those two people one? He abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, reconciling them both, this is Jew and Gentile, together in one body through the cross. If you go over to Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2. Let's start in verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, that was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. You say, okay, now what, what is he talking about? Is he talking about our sins or is he talking about the law of Moses? Let's keep reading. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Verse 16, so, he's connecting the two thoughts. He says, so, let no one judge you in food or drink regarding a new uh, festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. If you go back to 2 Chronicles 31.3 and many other places in the Old Testament, that's how they talked about those festivals that were aligned with the Old Testament. So the law of Moses was given to Israel and Israel alone, and it lasted until Jesus nailed it to the cross, and then go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. This is the account uh, of Luke where he's talking with the disciples after his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? So sometimes you'll say, well, did the, law, did, did, the, did the gospel go into effect as soon as Jesus died? You know, this, I'll tell you why this is important in a second. But look at Luke chapter 24. Look at verse 47. This is after the resurrection. He's already appeared to his disciples on the road to Emmaus. Verse 46, let's start there. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning where? At Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry, but go wait in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. So he says, look, this is after the death, burial, and resurrection. He says, hey, you're going to go and you're going to wait in Jerusalem. And whenever the Spirit comes upon you, you're going to have the power to then do what? Preach repentance and remission of sins. Now, you've heard this passage a lot, but go over to Acts chapter 2. That's really the fulfillment of this. In Luke 24, 47, he says, repentance and remission of sins will be preached beginning in Jerusalem. And the fulfillment of that is the passage that you all probably know, love, and can quote. And that's Acts chapter 2 and 38. When the people were pricked in the heart in verse 37, and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And he said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. So in Luke 24, 47, repentance and remission of sins. In Acts 2, 38, repentance and baptism for the remission of sins. The new covenant came into effect on the day of Pentecost. Now, why is that important? You know, I want to ask you a question. If you came over to my house, <clears throat> and you knocked on the door, and my wife let you in and said, Hey, uh, you know, come on in, Mornay. And Mornay said, hey, I, I want to talk to Aaron. And she said, oh, he's, he's right through there. And at my house, you come through the front door, you can look into the, the backyard through these uh, two windows. And you see me out there just wailing away on this big wood structure. I'm building an ark. And not an Ark of the Covenant ark. I'm talking a Genesis 615, 300 cubits, 50 cubits, 30 cubits ark. And you walk out there, and Mornay says, Aaron, uh, I mean, that's cool that you're building that. It looks pretty nice, but how's your HOA feel about that? Uh, what, what are you building? And I say, well, I'm building an ark. 
Why are you building an ark? Well, I mean, Genesis 6, I've been reading my Bible through. I got six chapters in. It said I had to build an ark for the saving of my household. And you would say, no, that, Aaron, that's not written to you. That's, that's written to Noah. He lived under a different covenant. He was given different instructions. And it's a cool boat. And they built one in Kentucky, but you're wasting your time, right? Why do I say that? Because if you don't know the differences in the, in the covenants, that's really the, the misunderstanding with who? The thief on the cross, right? People say, I want to be saved like the thief on the cross. And you say, well, I mean, he lived under a different covenant. The new covenant of Christianity, which all people that are alive today and have been for the last 2,000 years, um, they've all been under the law of Christ. They haven't been under the law of Moses that the thief on the cross lived under. So it's important to know the difference in the covenants, whether we should keep the Sabbath or not. Why the thief on the cross had a different requirement for salvation than we did, okay? So we need to know the books of the Bible intimately. We need to know the different dispensations. I want to give here 10 or 11 uh, tips to improve your Bible study because the the verse says if you want to uh, basically know how to handle a right, you need to do what? Study. You need to be diligent. So I've got a few recommendations. Number one, uh, get a good Bible. Uh, Take it everywhere with you. One of the best things I ever did uh, an elder recommended, he said, Aaron, you need to get a Bible, and you take that one Bible with you every single place you go, every lectureship, every Bible class, uh, every time you watch a podcast at home. If you're driving, you can't really take notes, but if you're reading books, anything you do, you, take, you keep that one Bible with you everywhere, and you just start writing down notes. Do you know how many things? Sometimes I'll say something in a sermon, and somebody will say, wow, man, how'd you remember that? And I'll say, well... No, I'm just kidding. It was in my Bible. I wrote it down when I heard BJ or when I heard Mornay or when I heard Jason preach. And actually, I heard this uh, three years ago at PTP, and I wrote it down. And I'm preaching, I'm reading. I'm like, oh, that's a great note. And I just spit it out. And someone says, man, I can't believe you remember that. I don't remember it. It's because I take notes in my Bible. And I know some people don't like to write in their Bible. Sometimes it gives me problems. Sometimes you see me up here quiet looking. I'm trying to find my place because I have too many highlights and notes. But I recommend getting a good Bible, starting and taking it with you everywhere, taking notes, writing down things. Uh, Read your Bible twice as much, minimum, as you read other books. Uh, I talk to people sometimes, and how's your your Bible reading going? Oh, it's great, I have this this devotional book by so-and-so, and and they show it to me, and number one, most of them aren't even members of the church, which should never happen. Uh, But second of all, they're reading this devotional, I'm like, oh, I mean, are you reading reading your Bible? Well, no, I, I like this devotional book better, right? We've got to be very careful about the stuff we put into our heads. I recommend you have to be reading your Bible way more than you read any other book, okay? That's the second tip I would give you. Uh, Number four, when you find someone more knowledgeable than you, ask them to teach you. Um, There's a man that was very uh, influential in my life that no one even hardly ever hears about. His name is Adam Hudson. When I lived in North Carolina, I was unfaithful to church in my early 20s, and I started to get serious mid-20s. And there was this one elder, he's an African-American guy, Every time he got up and did Lord's Supper or preached, he preached in the Old Testament. And I remember just sitting there listening to this guy saying, man, how does he know so much? And so one time I went up to him and I said, "Uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Hudson? He's like, yes, Aaron. I said, "Uh, would you teach me? He said, what do you want to know? I said, I trust you way more with that. What, what, What do I need to know? And so we started having, every Tuesday at 2 p.m., I would go to this elder's house. And we did Tuesday at 2 because I couldn't remember any other time. I would forget So we did Tuesdays at 2 p.m., and I'd go over to his house, and he would sit down with me, and he would just teach me. And we'd go through verse by verse. And you know what? That took a lot of time. We probably spent three or four years going through the Old Testament. But guess what? I learned the Old Testament. And he spent that time and effort with me, and most of the things, a lot of the things that I learned came from that man who was an elder in the church, all because I just said, hey, will you please teach me? So find somebody that you trust and ask them to teach you. Ask questions about things that you don't understand. Also, be careful as you study about thinking you found something new. I can tell you many times I would be studying and I'd be reading and I'd be up at 5.30 in the morning and I'm thinking, oh man, no one in the brotherhood's ever seen this before. And then I'd call my preacher and say, hey, hey, uh, Elisha, have you, ever, have you ever read this passage? Yep. And I'd say, okay, now have you ever thought about this? Because man, I know we teach this, but I'm starting to think. And he'd say, okay, all right. He'd say, come up to my office. I'd go up to his office and I'd show him what I thought I'd found that nobody for 2,000 years had found some of the the great preachers we have, and I thought, "Ah, hey, I'm pretty clever. I found something new. And every single time, he'd show me other verses and explain things, and I'd say, "Uh, okay. So be careful as you study and and ask people who are more knowledgeable than you. Uh, Don't expect your growth to be overnight. Be patient. Growth takes a lot of time. 
Uh, I remember this story that I've heard. I don't know. It's probably happened to multiple preachers. But uh, the woman walked up to a preacher after a, a lesson, and she said, she said, I would give anything to know the Bible like you do. She said, I would give my life to know the Bible like you do. And you know what he said? He said, ma'am, that's exactly what I've done. He said, every day, I spend more time. He, he had given his whole life, dedicated his life to the study of the Bible, and that's why he knew the Bible so well. Don't base your faith on a man unless that man is Jesus Christ. Don't base your faith on anybody that you meet. I don't care if you've known them for 20 years and you think they're the most faithful person. It's great to have role models. Paul said imitate him as he imitated Christ. But don't put your faith in any person except Jesus Christ. Work on your blind spots. All right. Uh, if there's a book of the Bible that you have no idea what it's about, read it. Study it. This last one, change your daily routines to what you listen to. Uh, one of the best things I ever did when I was trying to learn was I said, you know what, I can hear a song that I heard that came out in 2002, right? And I'm 37, so young kids are like, I wasn't even born then. I can hear a song from 15 years ago. I haven't heard it in 15 years, and that music comes on, and guess what I know? I know every single lyric, right? You know why? Because when that song came out, I listened to it on repeat. And I remember thinking once, I wonder how much Bible I could learn if I started doing that with sermons. And so I remember one time I bought a ton of sermons from World Video Bible School, put them on my phone, and now when I'm mowing the grass or driving, instead of listening to music, I'm listening to sermons. And that was one of the best things that I ever did. I used to put garbage in, and guess what came out? Garbage. And so whenever you start putting Scripture in, you're going to get Scripture out. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Proverbs 23.7 says, As he thinketh within himself, so he is. Proverbs 15.28 The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. But the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. And Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If we want to be able to rightly divide, accurately divide the word of truth, we need to study. Philippians 4.8 says, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, of good report, virtue, praiseworthy, meditate on those things. Don't rely on anyone else's faith. Because... The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 that it's appointed once for a man to die and then comes what? The judgment. And on judgment day, you can't have somebody stand in front of you. You can't have, if you're, I mean, I got a daughter and a little son now. Trust me, I wish on judgment day they could stand behind me and I could say, Lord, judge me. We can't do that. Each person's going to have to stand before God on their own. So if there's anybody here tonight and maybe you want to study the, the Bible more, you maybe have said, look, I've been studying it, but I'm not sure whether I've handled it rightly and you want to study with somebody, please let us know. Maybe there's somebody here tonight that you've been here for the last day or so, you've been hearing God's Word, and you realize that now the Bible's perfect, it's inspired, it's authoritative, it's God's revelation, and you've learned that God wants you to become a member of His family by doing His will. The Bible's pretty simple about that. John 8, 24 says, Unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. If you've heard that gospel, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, and you believe it, John 8, 24, you need to be willing to repent of your sins. Acts 17.30 says, Times of ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere. That includes all of us. If you're willing to repent, you need to confess Christ. Romans 10.9 and 10. And finally, you need to be buried in the watery grave of baptism. And that's where you contact the blood of Christ. Sometimes people get confused. They hear us talk about baptism, and they think, well, where's the power in water? There's no power in water. The power is in the faith that you have when you obey God. And in Acts chapter 22 and 16, Paul had been praying for three days. He believed. He was penitent. And Ananias gets to him and he says, Arise, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If there's anybody that needs to obey the gospel, we're going to sing an invitation song. You're welcome to come forward. We can help you. You can be baptized into Christ tonight. You can leave here rejoicing. And then you start that walk as a Christian to live a faithful life. Maybe there's somebody else here tonight that's a member of the church that needs the prayers of the church, or maybe you have something that you need to take care of. If so, you can come forward as together we stand, the stand and sing the invitation song. Thank you so much for your attention.